to Matthew chapter number 20. Matthew's gospel chapter number 20. Appreciate the, the good songs this morning, the special music. Certainly should have prepared our hearts for the message today. The title of the message today is Destination Jerusalem. Here from Matthew chapter number 20. I want to invite you to get out your spiritual road map, turn on your spiritual GPS system. We're going to join the Lord on a journey this morning that led to the greatest event in all of human history. You'll notice with me verse number 17 here in Matthew chapter number 20 says, And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples apart in the way, and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. We'll stop there for just a moment. It had been three years since the carpenter from Nazareth first said to Peter and Andrew as they stood by their fishing boats, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They followed, and soon thereafter, his group of disciples would go to twelve all coming from different walks of life. They witnessed miracle after miracle. They heard transforming truth after transforming truth on a daily basis. And they had observed and got to observe the only perfect man and sinless man who ever walked the face of this earth. Now we find Jesus calling them aside as they are approaching Jericho. And along the way, they pause for a break. And it is here that the Lord announces to them that their destination is Jerusalem. And it is there in that chosen city that he would be crucified. And three days later, he would rise again. Notice with me, please, how the purpose of their trip to Jerusalem is stated there in verse number 18 and 19. He said, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him, and the third day he shall rise again. So we find here the purpose is stated very clearly. There in verses 18 and 19, he would be betrayed. He would be condemned. He would be delivered over to the Romans. And the Romans would mock him. They would scourge him. And they would crucify him. And then on the third day after his death, he would rise again. So the purpose of the mission is clear, to suffer, to die, and then to rise. That was his mission. This was the third time he had predicted these events to his disciples. But it was the first time that he had given the manner of his death, which would be crucifixion. This was a unique form of capital punishment that only the Romans employed during that time in history. But the facts that Jesus shared here make it clear that the crucifixion of Christ was not the end of an out-of-control mob. It was not an act of random violence by some first century uh, thugs or hoodlums. As a matter of fact, it's quite to the contrary. Because the blueprint for salvation's plan was drafted by the architect of the ages. And it was engineered by our eternal God. Revelation 13, 8 bears that fact out where it calls Jesus the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. The road to redemption led straight to Jerusalem and Jesus had set his face, as the saying goes, like a flint towards that city. Now I'd like you to notice the evidences of his omniscience that are seen throughout 
the scene that is described here in verses 18 and 19. And notice how he knew every detail pertaining to his pending death. He knew the place, Jerusalem. He knew the people that would betray him and condemn him. He knew it would be Judas, one of his disciples. He knew the chief priests and, and the scribes and the religious leaders of the Jews would condemn him. And then, yes, he knew the pain. The pain that he would endure as the result of his, the public mockery, the scourging by the Romans and the cruel crucifixion. Many people would die from the scourging even before they could reach uh, the crosses that they were crucified on. One forensic researcher named Dr. Alexander Metherell said the following about the Roman scourgings which preceded his crucifixion, and I quote, Roman floggings were known to be terribly brutal. They usually consisted of 39 lashes, but frequently there were a lot more than that, depending on the mood of the soldier applying the blows. The soldier would use a whip of braided leather thongs with metal balls woven into them. When the whip would strike the flesh, these balls would cause deep bruises or contusions which would break open with further blows. And the whip had pieces of sharp bone and metal as well which would cut the flesh severely. The back would be so shredded that part of the spine was sometimes exposed by the deep, deep cuts. The whipping would have gone all the way from the shoulders down to the back and the back of the legs. One physician who has studied Roman beatings said, as the flogging continued, the lacerations would tear into the underlying skeletal muscles and produce quivering ribbons of bleeding flesh. A third century historian described a flogging by saying, the sufferer's veins were laid bare and the very muscles and sinews of the victim were open to exposure, end of quote just so happens that today in our foyer we have an example of, of the, the weapon or the tool that would be used to, to give out one of those floggings or scourgings. And we, I thank our member Tim Sullivan who's provided that display out there for us today. And I hope you'll take a look at that before you leave. There's no doubt our Savior had courage and commitment and compassion in these final miles as he made his way to Jerusalem, knowing all the while what was awaiting him there. However, in spite of Christ making his purpose for going to Jerusalem crystal clear and his prophecy very plain and pointed, his disciples did not comprehend completely what was going to happen when they reached that city. And that's displayed very clearly immediately following Christ's purpose statement in verses 18 and 19. You'll notice there in verses 20 to 28, and we won't read them all, that instead of questioning Christ about his impending death and resurrection, you'll notice here that some of them and some of their relatives ask about possible promotions and positions within his future kingdom which led to the Lord's lesson. You'll notice there in verses 26 and 27 about real greatness. And that real greatness is found in serving and being a servant leader. And then you'll notice with me another statement of his, the priority of his purpose in verse 28, and we'll read that together now. It says, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto but to minister, serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. That word ransom, it means the price to redeem a slave or prisoner. And the word for points to in the place of. And we find here that the ransom price would be paid with the very life and blood of Jesus Christ. And you and I... We're the prisoners of sin that were being set free. You say, how could these men 
talk about promotions and positions when Christ had just spoken about suffering and dying and rising again. Well, let's not be too quick to condemn them because every week, many times, we sit in church or stand in church and we sing songs like we just sang and you hear a preacher preach the gospel like I'm preaching right now and what do we think about? What do we think about? We think about a lot of things that aren't near as important as what Jesus was saying in those verses, don't we? We think about all kinds of things. I'd be ashamed to, uh, to put up on this wall some of the things that are thought about while songs are being sung about a Savior and while the Word is being preached about Him dying and suffering and bleeding what goes through the minds of sinful men. In just a few moments, we will be observing the Lord's table and we'll be taking juice and, and bread that symbolize His broken body and, and, and His shed blood. And I hope that you will allow the words that we're reading right now and that I'm preaching to you right now to prepare your heart for that sacred time. We find here that His purpose was very clear in this redemptive plan that would all culminate in Jerusalem. And I want you to notice here that everything he told them that was going to happen, it happened. It happened in the way he said it would. We see his purpose very clear. In the second place, I would like you to notice with me the power Christ displayed on his way to Jerusalem and the evidences of his uh, om omnipotence. We've seen his omniscience meaning that he is all-knowing, and we see his omnipotence in that he is all-powerful. We see it coming into view here in these verses, verses 29 to 23, and you'll notice here beginning in verse 29, he talks about these two men, these two men that were, were by the roadside and they were blind and, and they were crying out. These men, both blind, were sitting by the roadside where they normally begged this day. They had heard that Jesus Christ was passing by, and so they had a unique purpose. They were crying out for mercy. For you see, these men were very aware of their desperate need for Christ and for what He could do for them alone. There were no blind hospitals at that time. There were no researchers trying to cure blindness. There were no schools for the blind at that time. These men knew that their only hope was this one who was all-powerful, who was God in the flesh, that could restore their sight. And so we find that as they cried out, there was a multitude following Christ. Verse 31 tells us, describes this multitude as being very cold and unconcerned. They had no sympathy. They bluntly told him to be quiet or them to be quiet. The blind men were not intimidated, however, because you'll notice verse 31 says, they cried out all the more, saying, have mercy on us, O Lord, recognizing his lordship, the son of David, recognizing that he was indeed the Messiah. So their sense of need was stronger than the desire to be at peace with the multitude. And the master took note, as we see described. And I hope today that as the word is being preached, that there might be somebody here that the Holy Spirit of God will work in your heart and the sense of your need will become greater than the peer pressure of someone sitting next to you or the people that you're going to face when you leave this place or, or, or some thing that Satan, a uh, prideful thought that Satan puts in your mind. If the Spirit of God is dealing with you about your need of Christ, may you not allow that power to overcome the sense of your need. And if God is saying to you this morning through the power of His Spirit, you need Christ, you need forgiveness, you need to come back to me. Listen to that voice. Listen to the one who wants to have mercy on you today. We see this master, verses 32 to 34, and Jesus, it says, stood still. Boy, I like that. 
he stood still and he called them and said, What do you want me to do? We see this call and this compassion for him on his way to Jerusalem with his face set towards that city to hear the cry of these two blind men and to stop and to stand still and to ask them, what can I do for you? It made it possible for them to come to him to express their need. You'll notice the Lord met that need. It says there that he opened or they asked for him to open their eyes. And he had compassion upon them, it says. And he touched them and their eyes. And immediately their eyes received sight. And they followed him. You know, those of us that have read the Bible so many times and, and read through the scriptures and even taught and preached them, sometimes we overlook things and we just move on like it's commonplace but think with me for a moment the only one who could cause blind eyes to see was the one who made them and we've had a whole lesson here one time in Sunday school Tim Sullivan taught it about the complexity of the human eye and it's all the, all that is involved in that one little organ and for Jesus to be able to to heal their blinded eyes proved once and again that this was God in the flesh. This was no normal man. He was the master. They recognized him as that. This was quite a request to open blind eyes, but Jesus was powerful enough to do this. We find that they not only received their physical sight, but I believe that they received their spiritual sight as well because they followed him. They followed him. Let me say to you this morning, if you claim to be a Christian, you won't be perfect and you will sin, but you have a desire to follow him. We can't claim the name of Christ and live like the devil. We can't claim to be a Christian and, and then live all week like we've never met Christ. We as believers, if we have believed upon Him in our hearts and we have trusted Him as our Savior, we need to be following Him, not just on Sunday morning, but every day that we live our lives. They followed Him. I would ask you today to see your need. See Christ's power and cry out to him for mercy today. Let him restore your spiritual eyesight. And allow the spiritual blindness that sin has brought to turn into light. That is what the former slave trader John Newton wrote about when he penned that hymn that we all know, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. For God to take a traitor of slaves and use him to write a song like that only comes about through the power of God, the grace of God, and the mercy of Almighty God. Only the saving power of Jesus can do that for a person. And I'm glad to tell you, he's still doing that in lives today. He can do that for you today if you do not know him. I'm always stirred by the words that, that Jesus spoke to the apostle Paul, who was Saul, who was a murderer of Christians and on his way to Damascus to uh, arrest more Christians to persecute and, and when he struck him blind in arresting he caused him not to be able to see physically in order to open his eyes spiritually and as soon as the, the Paul realized who he was talking to on that road I believe he put his faith in him because he called him Lord 
And after Paul was converted and, and the Lord was giving him his mission and his purpose in Acts 26, 18, these are the words that, that he gave to, to that apostle to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins. My friend, he wants to do the same for you today if you don't know him. He wants to deliver you from darkness to light. And if he's done that for you, at some point in the past, I hope that you're grateful today. And I hope that when we partake of the Lord's table, that you'll block everything else out and you'll every other person out and you'll focus in on what he has done for you. And think back of the day that your eyes were open and he loved you enough to show you the truth and allow you to hear the gospel and to believe. We must give him thanks for that today and remember what he's done for us. Has there been a time in your life when you recognized that you were lost and you cried out to God for mercy and forgiveness of sins? I'm not asking you if you've joined a church. I'm not asking if you were baptized when you were a baby. I'm asking you, have you cried out to the Lord for mercy? And if you put your faith in the crucified and resurrected Lord, if you haven't, he's able and available to hear you today if you will cry out to him. Last of all, but not least, you'll notice with me the presentation that is given in verse 1 through 11 of chapter number 21. As they approach their final destination, let's read what happens as they enter into the city here. It says, And when they drew nigh to Jerusalem and were come to Bethpage and to the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples. And we find here he told them where the, where the donkey would be that, that they could ask to use. And as he mounted that donkey and as he began to ride into Jerusalem, we find that this was a fulfillment of the prophecy in Zechariah 9.9. 9. And you notice there in verse 5, it, it's quoting that Old Testament prophecy, how the Messiah would enter in to Jerusalem. And as he entered the city, you'll find many spread their garments in the streets and, and put out palm branches for them to pass over. This was something that was reserved for royalty. The multitudes of people who were walking in front of him and behind him, we see here, were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. This likewise came from the Old Testament Psalm of Psalm 118 and verse 25 and 26. And, and that phrase Hosanna means save now, save now, we pray. These were words from the 118th Psalm that they would sing at the Passover each year. And in just a few days, Christ would become the Passover lamb in order to save them from their sins. Yet they believed that he was coming to set up his kingdom. When in reality, he was coming not as a political ruler, but as a pure and spotless lamb to be offered as a sacrifice for sin. Yes, in a few days, he would wear a crown, but it would be made of thorns. Verse 10 says, when he came into Jerusalem, you'll notice, all the city was moved or stirred up. We have derived our English word seismic, which we usually use to describe earthquakes from this Greek word. There is no doubt his entry into Jerusalem shook that city morally and spiritually from one end to the other. You'll notice in verse 10, those who did not know who Jesus was asked the question, who is this? Who is this? And that question is still an important question for all of us to ask today. It's also important that we answer it accurately and correctly today because he is God incarnate. Only God could prophesy and fulfill what we've seen here. 
Only God could do what he did. He is not only God incarnate, but we find that the Gospel of John in verse 316 tells us he is the Son of God. John 1, 29 tells us he is the Lamb of God who offered himself for the sins of all mankind. Please understand, he came to be our Savior. He came to be the one in which we could receive everlasting life. And if you don't know where you're going, the second after your heart stops beating, I want you to know that you can know. You can know from the one who is life everlasting, who defeated death and hell and the grave and has been there and back and arose victoriously. He is the one who can give you everlasting life and assurance. And I invite you to come to him today if you've never done that. How do you come? You come just as you are. You come in simple repentance, recognizing your sin and recognizing that Jesus died as a sacrifice for your sin. You don't come with your robes of religion like the Pharisees had wrapped around them. No, you come. You come in those filthy rags of unrighteousness like we all have had to come, recognizing that there's only one who can make us clean. If you've never come to him, I want to invite you to come to him today. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me in just a moment? We're going to partake of the Lord's Supper, but before we do that,